Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event um, where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians. We do the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, and they are all recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and see all the recordings of all our previous sessions are available there. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch, so anywhere across Nebraska or across the country or even in other countries we've had people come <laughs> as um, attendees and speakers, um, you can watch the live show and the recordings. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, uh, book reviews, interviews, um, basically anything related to libraries, we're happy to have it um, on the show. Um, we have commission staff, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do sessions, um, do episodes of the show, and we also have um, guest speakers that come in sometimes. And this morning we have a combination of that. Um, this morning we are going to be hearing about, um, here at Lincoln City Libraries, here in Lincoln, Nebraska, their in-service day that they did in March, was when it was, back in March, um, about program Bridges Out of Poverty. And today with us we have um, Pat Leach, the director, over here, and um, Julie Hector, assistant director, will be um, talking all about that. And over on the end there, Laura Johnson, who's our continuing education coordinator, will give some just info about the grant that helped them uh, have this program that was offered um, via the Library Commission, the Continuing Education and Training Grant. So um, I'm just going to hand over to you guys now, Julie, uh, right. and you Good. can um, take it away. Okay, thanks. Tell us about your program. Uh, first, I'll give a little background about Lincoln City Libraries. For those of you that don't know, um, we are a system of eight locations and a bookmobile and approximately 150 staff. We serve Lincoln and Lancaster County, and that uh, population for Lancaster County is 293,407 people in 2012, mm -hmm. and the city of Lincoln is about 265,000 people. And we have some uh, estimates of the amount of res residents living in poverty, which in 2010, 42,319 residents of Lincoln live in poverty, and in 2010, 12,864 of Lincoln's 59,450 children lived in poverty, which is about a 21%. 21% um, of them lived in poverty, and actually in the next year, that amount increased by 25%. So we have seen a lot of information in local news and um, reports, articles, that we thought that was something that uh, Lincoln City Libraries needed to address with our in-service training. So our in-service training is something that happens on an annual basis. It's um, been on different topics, but it's for all staff in Lincoln City Libraries to attend. And we try to have something that's uh, relevant to their work and maybe personal lives something that's going to help them serve the residents of the community better. Um, we formed a committee actually in November 2012 to talk about what we wanted to do for in-service in March and the topic that came up was poverty in Lincoln and Lancaster County. Um, we did a lot of discussion about that and after meeting as a committee and gathering input from staff and management, we decided that we would really be interested in bringing in a nationally known speaker on the topic, Jody mm -hmm. Farr, who's done the Bridges Out of Poverty training um, at several several locations in Nebraska, and I believe an in service. Or I think she did a, a pre conference at, at one LA. point. Uh -huh. um, so we were interested in bringing in someone nationally known, someone who was familiar with a program that would be relevant to our staff and our community. And that's why we were really wanted to get Jody Farr. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of funding to bring in a national speaker on our own. So the great part about that was we applied for a grant from the Nebraska Library Commission for a continuing education and training grant. Um, so we could help support bring, bringing in Jody Farr to speak at in-service. I don't know, Laura, if you want to talk about that grant process um, yet. or I can just say that we do um, have a program where every year we have a certain amount of money to give for uh, continuing education and training grants. 
We like to support this kind of project. So any kind of training, um, if people want to go to conferences, for instance, this year a lot of people went to the ARSL conference, and we kind of dedicated the money to that. So this was last year, the, mm -hmm. yes. the money. Yes. Um, our year doesn't run quite calendar. <laughs> Um, and I would just like to encourage people to um, really apply for the grants. What we're really looking for is, what we look for in the grant applications is, did you have a good idea, and have you put together a plan that we think you're going to be able to pull off the idea? Mm -hmm. um, it's a great way to get started on grant writing. Uh, we were just talking a little earlier about how so many people are having to learn to write grants right. mm -hmm. um, because you're never going to get a more sympathetic reading than you do here. <laughs> and this is a pretty simple and direct it is, process. It yes. is a fairly easy application. So we were thrilled. Uh, we thought this was such an interesting program and we were really pleased to be able to fund it. So yeah, great. it's great. Thank you. <laughs> So the great news is that we uh, were funded for a grant in December 2012, which was very exciting because it meant that we could actually bring in this, na this nationally known speaker who we thought would do a great job training our staff and bringing a different perspective on poverty in our community and how it relates to the library. And uh, the purpose of our training was to provide library staff with an opportunity to learn more about the issues and then develop ways in which we can serve our, better serve our low-income customers. So that was the goal of the training. Um, it's a pretty, pretty broad pro, uh, process, mm -hmm. but um, we had a lot of helpful, helpful information. And just related to our planning for the in-service, we wanted to have kind of a broad education for our staff, not just have a one-day uh, training. We wanted to actually incorporate uh, a few months long training, including uh, activities coming up to the program and actually surveys um, and follow-up after the program. So it wasn't just a one-time thing. Um, in doing some of the planning, we realized that we needed to partner with a community organization, that there are a lot of community organizations mm -hmm. dealing with the same issues that we do. Uh, we decided to ask uh, the Center for People in Need to partner with us in this event. And they, this, is there a link from them over here or mm -hmm. just right there? Yeah. There's oh, a hey, link. There is, yeah. Perfect. And the Center for People in Need and I think Julie will talk about this a little bit more, is a Lincoln organization who does a lot of programming to help people in need, and that takes a lot of forms. So some of that is food distribution through FoodNet. Some of it is, say, Christmas gift distribution. They do quite a bit of technology training and have a technology lab. And then another interesting aspect for us for our day is that they have a very well-appointed meeting room for people to use. So in addition to relying on their expertise kind of going into this, we held our event there, which is another way for then all of our staff to be at their facility, to know where it is, and to have a sense for, for what it is. And then I think I don't want to sell more of what, of what we did at the center, but we also invited their staff to join us for the day. So there were other things, of course, that they were doing, but many of their staff then came in to hear Jody Farr as well. So that's different, because I know a lot of times in-service days is just speakers come to the library, and right. you guys are all still right. in the same place. It's mm -hmm. kind of cool to get out and go somewhere else. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah, and I think out. that often, you know, as staff, you'll hear about a particular resource like the Center for People in Need, and it just seems kind of out there, but this mm -hmm. gave everybody a chance to see their facility and know some of the people engaged in that. So it worked out great. It did, and with the space that the center has, we were able to invite more guests to the mm -hmm. in-service training. In addition to our staff, we invited staff from LPS, um, from city government, from the commission, um, let's see, Nebraska Department of Labor, mm -hmm. and other special guests. Um, we had a great attendance. It was about 160 um, people attended the training, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, but before the training, we, um, in order to provide an in-depth learning experience for staff, we designed training actually before the uh, training day. So people would have a chance to 
think about the topic of poverty and how it affects them and their community before we actually get into the training. So we had several pre-service activities where we had, uh, and this is on the website, if anyone's interested, we had an online quiz about poverty in Lincoln and look at the numbers and staff were encouraged to take that quiz to see if they, oh, thank you. And there is the quiz up there and that was just to see if people really had an idea about poverty in our community. Um, and it, I think it was an education for all of us um, who think maybe we're familiar, but maybe we're not, about the extent of po uh, poverty in Lincoln and Lancaster County. Um, and then once people took the quiz, they could go back and look at the answers, which, <laughs> <laughs> which is really helpful to see if you're right on or if you're way off. And we actually have the answers posted on the website as well, so you can go through and look at that. which is pretty amazing looking at some of the numbers of the amount of the community who live in poverty and how, how many the Center for People in Need actually uh, serve, which is 30, 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting mm -hmm. for us in that, just as any library, we know that there are certain pockets of the population where we think, for instance, do we serve people in poverty well? Do we serve elderly people well? Do we serve children well? And clearly in Lincoln, if there are 42,000 people living in poverty, that is a significant group that we want to be sure we're serving well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In addition to some of the online quizzes, staff had time to do individual reading of articles in the Bridges to Par Out of Poverty book. Um, it's just to have time to familiarize themselves with the things that they'd be covering in the training and just kind of information that is very helpful. I'm just clicking now on what some of the resources that we were able to rely on from the Bridges Out of Poverty people, and this is a checklist about could you survive in poverty, so kind of an example of some of those pre-in-service mm -hmm. activities. And I think it really worked for um, staff to look at that and just to really think about how you would how would you, how could you survive if you were truly in poverty? And I think that that raises another point that came up quite a bit of a lot of the information that we covered is, I would say, fairly broad generalizations. And I know for some of our staff, which was entirely reasonable, there was a concern about are we generalizing in ways that are helpful? Are we avoiding just labeling? And so we talked a lot about using this kind of information to use broad strokes to talk about how a particular group of people tends to see the world, but to understand that always the person in front of you, the library is an individual whose needs are their own. But we feel like this kind of general information helped to give maybe a framework for an overall approach. In addition to some of the online activities, we actually had kind of poster sessions at the branches where questions were posted and then staff had the opportunity to write their thoughts or their questions on these posters. And um, some examples were questions like, does poverty exist in your life? Does poverty exist at or around Lincoln City Libraries? How does poverty affect all people in the library area, not just those living in poverty? What barriers exist between Lincoln City Libraries and customers affected by poverty? What barriers exist at your library? There are a multitude of questions that staff had a chance to think about um, just as far as how we're serving that area of the community. And after everyone went through those responses, each branch had a meeting and met and discussed their responses, which is where some of the, the input came, mm -hmm. came in, which was interesting. And then all the responses were collected and compiled into a complete list for our system, and then it was available electronically for all staff to go through so they could see what other branches were discussing. And the other part of that, which I thought was really interesting, is that we gave staff the opportunity to come up with questions that they would like to see addressed during the training. So those were all compiled and they were sent to Jody Farr prior to the training so that she had a chance to address issues that we were facing at Lincoln City Libraries. 
And in addition, one more activity. We, uh, in March 2013, we did a snapshot survey at the Center for People in Need. And that was during a food distribution day, so there were about a thousand people who came in. And they did a quick survey for us and just some interesting statistics from that. 77% um, indicated that they use the library regularly. 41% indicated that they use uh, they used their spouse or partner or their children had library cards, which I, which I thought was great. Um, and the three most services they used at the library were checking out books and magazines, checking out DVDs, and using the internet. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to see how those people are using our facilities already. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit about Jody Farr and Bridges Out of Poverty. Jody is a nationally known speaker, as Julie mentioned, and I had heard her speak several years ago at a conference. A lot of what she talks about is she works often with people like librarians who work for institutions that basically are middle class institutions, mm -hmm. and she then talks about how different classes interact, and so we can use that information to think through when we design services and when we work with people, are there things that we might be doing that just aren't working for that particular population group. So um, I'm not sure that her workshop is listed here, but we'll take a quick look. You can see that they offer quite a few different sorts of things that, that they can present. And basically what we asked Jody to do is I think she took about a two-day workshop and compressed it into a shorter one for us. And we wanted her just to give an overview of how they would describe what are often called the hidden rules of classes. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, um, what, she, what she talked about a little to introduce the topic is, as typically middle-class people, we have a certain way of speaking, a certain way of interacting with the world, certain expectations. And again, speaking in very broad generalizations, what she talked about is how people who live in poverty, for a variety of reasons, their focus tends to be on relationships. And the key aspect of coping, if you're living in what's typically referred to as generational poverty, and that means it's not just that you've had a temporary setback, and so for a year or two you have less money. It means that probably for two or three generations your family has lived in poverty. Relationships are key. And that contrasts with, in the middle class, what's, what's considered key is achievement. And then she goes on to talk some about upper class people. In America, it's ten, it tends to be about connections. And the way that she would, would give examples of this, just to provide a little bit of illustration here, is she was talking about how if you live in poverty and you might have housing arrangements that are shaky, and maybe you drive a car that's somewhat unreliable, if you have employment, it may be that if your car breaks down, the way you're going to get to work is that you're going to call your sister. And it's going to be really important that you get along with your sister mm -hmm. in order to, to rely on each other. She will likely do the same for you later on or already has done so. Similarly with housing arrangements. If you are on the edge as far as being able to pay your rent and you're going to be evicted, it may be your brother-in-law who will take you in. And so that relationship is, is really very important. And kind of similarly then, uh, again, speaking in generalizations, it's important to protect that relationship. And so, um, for instance, growing up in my household, we would hear the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty middle class approach. If, if, um, if you're somebody who's lived in generational poverty, words do hurt you if they're attacking somebody with whom you have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so... What, what we might see at the library is fights that break out because one person has disrespected another. And to them, that's just a natural reaction because you can't disrespect somebody that somebody's in relationship with. And so sometimes we look at some of that behavior that happens in our library and think, well, why did that happen? And I think that part of what she was saying is if you grow up uh, following the hidden rules of any class, that's what you'll be following. And so it's important for us to know more about each other. Um, uh, similarly, something that happens at the library where we have rules that are based on the hidden rules of middle class, one of our main rules is to use the internet, you must use your own library card. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to be under their own names. 
And it taught a bit of education for us to help people see that it, even though their brother said, yeah, you can use my card, I don't mind, we don't want them to do that. We want them to be under their own name. And so, again, kind of thinking of what is the way that somebody thinks and how do we work with that. And Jody also talked quite a bit about, um, I, would, I think she described it as creating a stable environment. If you're living in generational poverty, as I mentioned before, it may be that your housing is shaky, your transportation might be a little bit shaky, a lot of your arrangements might be somewhat shaky. What we see at the library is when we, we, we as you would guess, encourage people to use our materials. But um, if we're not helping people understand that we want you to take them out, but if you don't bring them back, you could end up in some trouble with us. And so we have been working on how do we maintain that friendly, approachable information while still saying, you know, it's important to us that you are able to get these back on a timely basis. And I think later we're going to talk a little bit about how we've looked at some of our policies and mm -hmm. in light of some of this information. But one thing that we've known over the years is that in terms of children, if you live in a family that moves a lot, any time a family moves is a time when library materials get lost mm -hmm. or just can't be found for a while. And if you do happen to live in a family that moves a lot, you know, that could end up complicating your library life. So what we're looking at is how do we work with children especially, but families generally, when things, when things get missed. But all of this relates back to people living in generational poverty tend to operate with the hidden rules of their class. And so we want to be aware of that and respect that and work with that. And then as I mentioned, she talks about how within the middle class, achievement is more the orientation. And so a middle class family tends to be thinking about completing education, acquiring certain material items, doing some of those kinds of things, and that that's what um, the hidden rules of the middle class are about. When she, when she described those using various examples, um, she talked about then how relationships, when you're thinking about people living in poverty, how relationships do key into almost everything else. And then for the mental model, for the middle class, it, as I said, it's about achievement. And it's interesting then how, um, this was an exercise that we did, when you think about how does that key into things like financial planning, how does that key into education, how would that key into just different aspects of our living, I think that some of those exercises were just really helpful as we stop to think, okay, from my viewpoint or background, how do I, how do I see some of those things? So I think... Um, I think that her talk was to use the word bridge pretty clearly that we get this information and then we use it to create better experiences. And as I'm looking over some of the materials that she provided under mental model of generational poverty, it's described as a description of the concrete experience as well as the abstract representation of poverty. It's about vulnerability and then the relative importance and interlocking nature of those things. And um, it, this was something that when I read it, I, I paused in that she, she wrote, it's a, dis, a depiction of the trap, no future story, no choice, no power. And so part of what we're thinking is how do we provide reasonable choices? How do we, how do we give somebody power in order to make something good happen? Um, and then just generally when she talked about some of the constructs of of how they approach it. What they say they do is use the lens of economic class to understand and take responsibility for your own experience while being open to the experiences of others. And again, I think it's a matter of not labeling people but using this experience so that when we're working with people at the library, maybe it makes a little bit more sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects of this that I didn't mention is that Jody Farr is a really good speaker in the sense of, you know, when you're bringing somebody in for a whole day, you need to have somebody with really good content and also really good delivery. Mm -hmm. And she is somebody who combines both of those, I would say. She herself, she describes herself as having grown up in generational poverty. And so she has quite a few examples from her own life. And um, in her case, one of hers, I don't know that it really relates to the model so much, but she said, her trouble in the library was that she talked too loudly. That basically, yes. you know, she came in and was, uh, well, I think it was at the school library, yes. and she was told pretty much all the time to use her indoor voice. <laughs> and 
found it maybe not an especially welcoming place because she felt like she was always being told, you know, you're not quite following our rules appropriately. Um, and she gave several other examples in terms of interacting with other agencies as well. But she did, she did raise a few issues that I think we all thought about a little bit. And an example of that is how, um, depending on your circumstances, you might be filling out forms all the time. And so she was talking about barriers and perceived barriers and that if a person's first experience at the library is, here, fill out this form, we need all this information. She was saying something that's been helpful in some of the other places that she's consulted with is maybe some kind of master index for information. So probably the families who have children have already, say, registered for school. Is there some way of saying when you fill out this registration, it's also good for the library, it would be good for the health department, it would be good for a lot of these places that you are already going to interact with. And she was describing, um, I think as well, a situation where with each agency a family visits, they have to tell their story over and over. And is there some way of maybe creating coordination among coordinate organizations yeah. so that we're more working together? And I'm not... I'm pretty sure that we weren't able to solve that problem that day, but I think it was one of those suggestions that made us all pause and think, you know, we are kind of silos when it comes to the information that we gather, and trying to think if there was some way to, to make that process easier when you think of a family who visits maybe several institutions or offices throughout the course of a month or year. Is there some way to make that easier? Um, as we came out then of, of that day, um, what we were trying to put the focus on with our post and service activities was kind of figuring out what was it that people took with them in terms of the information, and then also what would we need to look at. And we tried to come to some consensus about what is the one thing that our library should do in response to what we learned at in-service day. And Juliet, I don't know if you want to maybe go ahead and talk about some of that some of the post and service mm -hmm. activities we had a system we actually had a branch and system-wide discussions about um, after we had the training day and what people got out of the training we had a really good response um, 81 percent of the staff indicated that the activities and training heightened or somewhat heightened their awareness of poverty in lincoln and its impact on our customers so we thought that was a really good result and also, as far as the Jody Farr presentation, 88% felt Jody Farr gave information that was applicable to their job and, and their daily lives, mm -hmm. which I think it's a really high rating for um, staff to find that, that mm -hmm. useful. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, everyone kind of agreed it was a really great training. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great to have some in system-wide discussions to mix up people from different locations and to mm -hmm. get their ideas about barriers and what we can better do to assist low-income families. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some something that came up in some of those discussions is, you know, anytime, I, I compare it to sort of like when you first take a Meyer-Briggs test, a personality mm -hmm. test, and you realize, oh my gosh, you know, this explains so much of why maybe something didn't make sense to me or I had trouble communicating something. And I think that our, my hope in bringing Jody Farr in to speak to library staff is that the way that we grew up in terms of class is sort of the air that we breathe. And often we're not aware that we're behaving and thinking a certain way until somebody says, oh wait, other people see this differently. And I, my hope was that we would all begin to to think about that in terms of if there are significant parts of our population who see the world differently, we need to be aware of that and adjust mm -hmm. in ways that, that make our institution work. So it was interesting in some of the post-discussion how much people maybe saw that or then were able to say, oh, I can think about this a little bit differently now. Um, and after those discussions and ideas and lots of discussion, mm -hmm. Um, we came up with some ideas for changes we could make and um, new policies we could implement, which I, we can both talk about mm -hmm. that. It's, um, we developed a task force for um, staff to develop three to five statements for staff to use when they're giving someone a library card, signing up for a library card, or maybe just checking out items to a person so we don't 
we set them up for success. Um, we talk about fines and you're responsible for this and just to make sure people are aware of their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I think that staff were a little bit worried and we kind of touched on this earlier that we get pretty excited when we give somebody a library card and we really emphasize all this great stuff, which is great stuff by the way, <laughs> that, you, that we are that we are happy to loan you and then we realize that depending on the family or the child, in some ways that's not setting them up for success, that we feel like then if they have trouble that ends up blocking their library card and instead of becoming a regular library user they become somebody who has a blocked library card and so we felt like there would be a balance I would say of the friendly invitation to use the library that's accompanied by a friendly information piece about how to stay in good standing. Right. Exactly. Um, one of our, I think it was one of our biggest policy changes um, was actually allowing library card holders who have fines or fees over ten dollars to use internet at our library locations and to be able to use um, electronic resources such as databases um, where before we block them for that from that kind of access yeah. nowadays it seems it's I can see that being very there's so many things people need to get online for now, applying for jobs, unemployment, all the, a lot of services provided yes. by the city or the county for them that the library being the one place to yeah. go for that and saying, well, you owe $10 because you didn't bring back that DVD, right. blocks them off of everything else. It, yeah. Well, we, it was interesting that we had quite a bit of staff interaction about this change because I think that one, well, once you've had a policy in place, it's hard to change it because then that becomes mm -hmm. kind of a way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And our line of thought about that particular policy was that we felt it was a reasonable consequence if you have not returned materials on time that you can't take out more materials but mm -hmm. until you've paid your fines. But we certainly welcome people to come in and use the library and we felt it made sense to allow them to use the internet because they weren't like they couldn't take it with them essentially <laughs> right. so where our concern was that they had a record of not returning things on time use of the internet wasn't not really a matter of returning yeah. something on time mm -hmm. and then Chris as you said it's such a major internet is such a major information right. source that where we're information providers for the whole community we felt that it simply didn't make sense to know that so many people couldn't use the services and I would say that in our discussions with providers such as the people at the Center for People in Need, when we would talk to them about library services, often their response was, you know, we have lots of people whose library cards are blocked because of fines. Mm -hmm. And I think that they were pleased to see that we were taking a different approach on that. And it really is a balancing act between, on the one hand, keeping people accountable, but also mm -hmm. saying that within this situation we can allow a certain amount of access. So. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to find a balancing act there. Yeah. I think this was all about access, mm -hmm. especially with unemployment benefits being all online. Right, and yes. We've had people from the Department of Labor here on right. Encompass Live before talking about that mm -hmm. it's all online exactly. now. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, well, that was part of the discussion. And that very often the library is the only place where these people really have right. mm -hmm. the ability to access the Internet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So cutting that off is really severing a lifeline for them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the other policy changes that we made is we began having a certain category of library card called youth limited use. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that if, if youth come in to the library to get a card and they don't have somebody with them who can verify their address, we still allow them to get a card and then they can check out a limited number of items. Um, kind of, I would say, in some ways protecting our losses, but more giving them a chance to establish library library use yeah. and then we have a parent come in with them to verify and then take that limit off. Is that That's, a fair enough basic yes. description? And we felt that that was a way again to set kids up to succeed from the start so that again they don't start by taking out a whole bunch of materials that maybe they can't take care of. Mm -hmm. We get them into a pattern of library use and we feel like it sets them up to do really well. They have a good first impression of the library, too. Of, yes, of course, we'll give you the, the library card. You don't have to come back again with your parent. And, you know, yeah, that's right. Really right and for that. we've also tried to spread word about that we have something that we refer to as a fresh start waiver. 
And if somebody has accumulated significant library fines, and if they did that when they were a minor, so it, they might still be a minor or not, but if they accumulated those fines as a minor, we're willing to waive a certain amount of those charges so that then they can clear their record and use their library card again. And I had somebody just last week come up and tell me that that had made a huge difference for her. Actually, she's a young woman who is a single mom, and she's been doing quite a bit of speaking in the community, community about issues of poverty and describing what her upbringing was like and some of the ways in which poverty interacted with her drive to succeed. But it was a heartwarming story for me in that she described how her daughter, who I think is now just entering school, is doing really well with reading, partly because she's been read aloud to so much mm -hmm. because of books from the library. And that is exactly what we want to have happen mm -hmm. when we provide a fresh start waiver is giving people a chance to try again once they know how it works and then mm -hmm. wanting to see that difference go into other generations. So in many ways that's the perfect story. In her case, she had a teacher who advocated for her and kind of helped her navigate who do you need to ask, what form do you need to fill out so that we can make it happen. And it turned out to be a great, a great ending to that story. It's a great story. Well this is the this was one of the things that made this grant so interesting for us. Was the idea that you didn't just have a speaker. Mm -hmm. That you prepared people for the speaker and that you did follow up on it so that the the material was emphasized and reinforced mm -hmm. and that part of your um, uh, I forgot the word. I lose words all the time <laughs> um, it's just terrible <laughs> um, your, your um, assessment of mm -hmm. the success of this program was how how it affected people afterwards mm -hmm. and as you say you've actually changed policies yes. now I'm not saying that any continuing education should change policies what I'm saying is there does need to be reinforcement of the message mm -hmm. and assessment of the success of the program right. mm -hmm. and that was a very important part of this we thought well, I feel like our staff person, uh, our librarian, Carol Swanson, did a good job of organizing that. And we thought some, too, about which of our staff should be on the in-service committee to represent all the branches and continue to stay in touch with our people about what the in-service was going to be about and then, and then the follow-up, as you say. Yeah. Oh, and maybe we should give a shout-out to Carol Swanson. Poor Carol yes, has thank a you, Carol. Of the case of <laughs> Yes, Carol Swanson, if, if, if anyone is paying attention to the description of this session, um, who is going to be here changed from when we started okay. till today. Yeah, um, yeah nice. Carol approached us about wanting to do the session to talk about and share what they did and work with Laura mm -hmm. on it. Um, but unfortunately, once it came up to it, she wasn't able to be here. Yes. <laughs> so get better, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then we have done uh, a few other ways of continuing this topic. For instance, our training calendar through the year includes some topics that relate back to the in-service day. So the People's City Mission did a presentation on the services that they offer. The Department of Labor, as you noted earlier, they work so closely with people who are looking for jobs, and we, so we've done some training including them. And then we have plans for topics such as mental health, working with substance abuse, working with diversity generally, so that our training calendar through the year also relates back to what we did on our in-service day. Do you feel that this poverty generally is a more urban than rural kind of problem? You know, I would have to look at the numbers. My hunch is that it looks different maybe in a bigger city, but I have a feeling that the poverty rates throughout the state probably indicate that almost all of us are serving a significant number of people who live in poverty. Well, I think sometimes the temptation is to think of it as being very urban, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that is it true. I well, looked at the map from the Center for People in Need and who they mm -hmm. serve in Lancaster County, and mm -hmm. it, it's more concentrated in the city of Lincoln, but it's spread out it's everywhere. through the entire county. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's I think it's an issue everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would say that kind of looking a little bit big picture, I think we all take a lot of pride in libraries and the access that we provide, and so one of the ways that we evaluate how well we're doing is 
whether we're pulling in people from really all kinds of groups. And I think if we felt that we were serving primarily and only middle class people, we would be saying to ourselves, you know, we need to be making some changes here to appeal to a broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what influenced us to do this. And I would say the other piece is that in Lincoln there have there's been quite a bit of information about the growth of the number of children in poverty. And Julie, you mentioned that kind of early on in the presentation, that a lot of what we're thinking about is we're all about having Lincoln be a strong city and a place where people want to live. And so we need to be thinking, given that new circumstance, what are we doing to strengthen the community by giving some really great library service for that whole spectrum of people? Yeah. I was actually I was wondering something similar to that. Um, you had given out statistics about um, poverty in Lincoln as a whole, and then you talked about how you, it was good to get the different branches, the people from the different branches talking and discussing together about what's going to happen in their area, in their library. Did you have any breakdown of poverty in different parts of the city? So like so-and-so branch could say, oh, here it's more like this, and ours over here on the other side of the city is like this. I mean, was there any um, breakdown of that that people, that you guys had access to? I don't know that we refer directly back, say, to statistics, but mm -hmm. I think that each branch has a sense for... Um, well, I, as an example, I'd say that some of our branches that are in parts of town considered newer or maybe upper, mm -hmm. upper middle class. In, within Lincoln, almost every part of the city has low income housing, for example, mm -hmm. or places such as that where we probably don't have any big area in Lincoln that is without people in poverty. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, where it looks in the southwest part of the city is probably a lot different than, say, in the northwest or northeast part. And um, so I think all the branches were sort of reflecting on the people that they serve and who comes in the impact. Yeah. Branch, yeah. Who comes in and, and what the concentration is. I mean, certainly we have a couple of branches that, prob that, that serve a higher number of people who would be considered in generational poverty. And we're actually just about to do some of the studies right now about, mm -hmm. yeah. about makeup around the different branches. And do people who use it, this is completely off the topic, but do people who use a branch generally only use that one branch? I think that people, anecdotally, I would say people use more than one branch. And usually, yeah. And it typically has to do with what other things are going on in their lives. So if they take piano lessons or yeah. go to a doctor yeah. in a certain place, they'll often stop at the library that's on their way somewhere else. Now, I'd be curious to know, I mean, that raises the question then, Laura, if a person has fairly limited transportation, I wonder if, if people who have fairly limited transportation tend to use the same location because that's a pattern that, that works for them. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Sometimes I think, well, I'm just absolutely, you know, moving from branch to branch all over. Mm -hmm. I, I try to get to them all. <laughs> yeah, we like that. <laughs> but I didn't know if that was typical or not. I've heard people like who work here talking about like I'm working. I work downtown, so I'm gonna pop over to right. downtown to do this. But I live right. so and so, so I'm gonna have them send the book I want to hold over there, mm -hmm. and so I'll get it tonight instead. And so they bounce right. back and forth between that kind of thing, mm -hmm. where they work, where they right. live, because I think of that's where they really typical. Them. Yeah, which is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is great. Mm -hmm. I did want to mention the continued partnership. Yeah. One of the other mm -hmm. changes is our continuing partnership with the Center for People in Need. Um, Carol had another meeting with, mm -hmm. um, let's see, probably in October, and we are actually going to be in their Complete Guide to Human Services booklet that they publish every cool. year. Cool. They're now going to include library information in that, um, which hasn't been in there before. Well, and I think... Um, that points out what's the, a great thing about collaboration is that our work with them, what I, what I would hope is that as they're working with their clients who maybe say, oh, I don't have access to the Internet, that their people are immediately saying, oh, the library is a good place to go for that, mm -hmm. so that they are carrying the word of what we offer into the homes of the families that they serve. They're also including at, at least one library question in their annual survey. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, I don't know if you've seen it, and you can look at it on their website, but it's the uh, Face of Poverty Today in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's their annual report. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of statistics in that, and they'll be including at least one question about the libraries in that, so that'll be great. And we're actually 
started in the summer and we're continuing to do a weekly story time at the Center for uh, People in Need on food distribution afternoons, which has been really mm -hmm. successful. So you're, cool. this has also encouraged some outreach. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's affected a lot of things. That's wonderful. Amazing. So there's all kinds of information <laughs> out there. <laughs> this is one of their promotional pieces, I do believe. Mm -hmm. um, this, the Center for People in Need did start just working out of a house. And now wow. they're in a really, it's a former Rod Kush furniture warehouse, right. which is yeah. where they operate now. And so they do a good deal of services to a variety of people. And their director, Beatty Brash, welcomed us on the day of our in-service. And again, they do a variety of kinds of distribution and work a lot in a lot of different ways with people who, for whatever reason, need, to, need some extra help. So um, finding ways of working with them, kind of as I mentioned before, allows us to use their relationships with people to support the work of the library. Would you say that access to information and lack of access to information was a major problem for people in poverty? Because this is something then that libraries really can absolutely really can help them. Absolutely. Well and I think the the piece of that too is then talking through how we how we work with people so that if it's a matter of needing information, often that's a matter then of talking to a librarian yeah. and figuring out what do I need to do to make this work. Mm -hmm. And I think that another aspect that we began to think about was as we're working with our customers to figure out what is their information need, how do we do that respectfully? And how do we, um, how do we work with people who maybe have a lower level of familiarity with technology. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, one of the monthly reports I recently received mentioned that one of our staff members had received a compliment from somebody who was so grateful to her for not making her feel stupid that she didn't know how to use the technology. And I think, again, when people come in needing information but they're not familiar either with computers or the whole process of getting on a website, part of our job is to work with them respectfully so that they can end up knowing what they need to know and come back to use it again. Yeah, that's uh, just this also kind of means that our libraries need to be informed about what the social services are. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. When I think that you know a lot of what librarians do is think, okay, where is the information source for this? You know if. Yeah. If somebody has a particular kind of need, how do we, how do we make that make that work well? Oh, okay. And then just other kinds of um, everyday things. Everywhere. For instance, at our main <laughs> library, we have a particular phone that is meant for the public to use. And so, how do we kind of make that work well again? If somebody has on again, off again phone service and sometimes mm -hmm. just needs to make a quick phone call, I think we I think we've been considering discontinuing that service, and it became apparent to us that. Eh, that probably is something that we need to continue doing. And um, so in many, I think just in terms of a lot of details of how do we provide service, a lot of what we heard from Jody Farr helped us think through whether something should continue, whether we should tweak it in some way, and how can we keep in mind the barriers so that we're helping people overcome them. Um, just want to say, if anyone has any questions or comments or thoughts from the audience, please feel free to type it into your GoToWebinar interface there on the questions section. I'm monitoring everything here. So um, we can uh, pass on if you do have any questions or comments. You know, one of our other areas of, of concern, and it didn't so much come up in this training, but people may be familiar with um, some of the research that was done maybe 10 or 15 years ago about how people at different income levels interact with their children. And mm -hmm. there are interesting statistics about how many words children hear between birth and kindergarten, and that lower income families tend to use a model of conversation that doesn't introduce as many words as middle class families when they're in communication with their young children. And I think, again, our line of thought with that is what can we be doing to encourage families to 
talk a lot and enhance vocab vocabulary. So um, we didn't mention it here, but we are working with the Every Child Ready to Read program in general, working with parents and daycare providers to do certain kinds of behaviors that partly relate to conversation and partly relate to reading aloud. And then we also continue to do some programs such as Primetime Family Reading Time, a mm -hmm. collaboration with Humanities Nebraska, which is all about using picture books for intergenerational book discussion. Mm -hmm. And our audience typically for Primetime Family Reading Time is lower income families. And we've typically worked with Spanish speaking families, although now we're also incorporating a Native American emphasis also. But again, thinking of what are the things that you can do that show how how a family would do that, and also that it's reasonably free of charge and reasonably easy to do and also been very effective. So again, thinking about how do we, in general, in our community, set kids up for, for academic success. Mm -hmm. Well, then, thank you very much. The, from our point of view, this was a rousing success. Um, you know, we're really thrilled to fund projects that work this well, and we have to say um, thank you for the good reports and stuff. That, mm -hmm. that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it also, you've really given us a lot to think about. I think everybody really needs to give the, this, not just the idea of grants, but the subject of this, really. Mm -hmm. We all need to give this a lot more thought. Well, we really appreciate that we had a sense that this is something that we wanted to do. We knew that money would be the main barrier. <laughs> and so being mm -hmm. able to get the continuing education training grant yes. made, made all the difference for us. So yeah. we, really well, we know that we that. appreciate that immensely. Well, good. Thank you. So, Laura, I, um, I know this year the grants, the continuing education grants went to the ARSL conference. They did. And is info coming for next year's? Well, it's, uh, um, we have not. Whatever yet. you know. We'll have, it up, <laughs> we'll have it up on the website and announce it when we have the dates. Um, I don't have the dates yet. Yeah, yes. um, as far as I know, we'll be offering grants uh, probably in a couple of different categories, either mm -hmm. sending people to conferences doing projects like this, or paying for people to go to, you know, there's so many online courses now mm -hmm. where, you oh, know, sure. a six-week course from Info People or That's something, mm -hmm. um, and paying for those as well. So we'll probably have those three different categories again. Um, and I do want to encourage people to apply. Mm -hmm. So keep your eyes on the commission website or blog or Facebook page, wherever we yeah. send things out, <laughs> and you'll get the info. All of the above. Yeah. That's great. All right, it doesn't look like any questions came in. That's fine. Um, everyone was here listening very intently. <laughs> so um, I think, um, unless you have anything else to add? Yeah. Yes. I think we're good, and we really <laughs> right. appreciate the opportunity to talk about Absolutely. this. So thanks yeah. a lot. Well, we were like, like Laura said, very happy to have you on. It was a very yeah, cool thank program. Thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Julie, Pat, and Laura, for being here today. Um, let's see everyone else here. So that will wrap us up for this morning's show. Um, it, it has been recorded, so um, if you want to, you can go back and listen to it later. Or when I announce the recording is up and ready to go and process, you can share it with all your colleagues and get out there and get more people. Uh, listening to it. Um, so that will wrap it up for this morning, but I hope you'll join us next week when our topic is um, seeing dots at Wilson Public Library. <laughs> Sounds terrible, <laughs> but it's not. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a program that uh, Laura Yogam at Wilson Public Library in COZAD did, International Dot Day. It's actually based on um, the book, uh, Peter Reynolds' book, The Dot. Um, let me actually have the website here. Where it's a day where you celebrate the, you know, concepts and everything about the book. Um, their library actually did it for a whole month. They did a month's oh, worth right. of activities, which she says um, they may reevaluate that for next time. <laughs> but um, it was a great program, and um, she's going to be on the show remoting in with us next week to tell you all about how they did that. 
um, at their library. So um, definitely uh, sign up for that and join us for that show next week. And if you are on Facebook, and Compass Live is on Facebook as well, um, we do announce our shows um, on our blog, the Commission's blog, and on our mailing list, but we do a Facebook page as well. So if you are on Facebook, go ahead and like us there, and you'll get notices of when new shows are coming, when recordings are available. Um, I did a reminder this morning that this one was coming up right today, so you can hop in and join us on the fly for that if you wanted to. So please do like us on Facebook if you are a big Facebook user. Oops. Other than that, I think we are wrapped up. No questions came in at the last minute, so thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 <laughs>